to this old photo of the, of the courthouse. And this was their concept of the Great Wall, or the Big Wall here. <clears throat> the problem that they had at that time was uh, dogs, pigs, cattle, horses, they, uh, they were just running everywhere. Because the, 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 the residential uh, uh, part of town was just close to, well, if you would, downtown. So they put the barrier up to keep them out of the courthouse. Of course, now they don't care what goes into the courthouse. <laughs> anyway. And I will read this with you. Uh, just to give a little bit of a preview. As early as 1789, North Carolina was awarded portions of Dyer County to soldiers in the Revolutionary War. Dyer County was still considered Chickasaw Indian land and no claims could be made as long as the Indians felt the land was theirs. In 1818, Andrew Jackson and Isaac Shelby made the treaty with the Chickasaws, granting the lands west of the Tennessee River and west to the Mississippi River <coughs> to the United States government. And our county was just a wilderness, swampy in many places, but it contained very rich alluvial soil, good hunting, and fine trees. One of the great rivers of the world, Mississippi, was on the back door and meandering through the county were tributaries of the Fork Deer River and the Oban River. All these rivers at that time were navigable, but was very important for getting farm products to market. <coughs> the original 60 acres was given for a county site by Joel Dyer in the year 1825. The location of the original 60 acres was bounded on the north by Magoy Street on the east by a line running north and south that passes on the west edge of where J.M. Collins' shop was. Most of you know where that was. Uh, on the south by the river and on the west by Clark Avenue. Does anybody know where Clark Avenue is? Does anybody know where Clark Avenue is? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dyersburg soon outgrew the original 60 acres and later the north boundary of the town became what is now known as Tucker Street and Phillips Street. The west boundary being King Avenue. A uh, note here, I, it, it didn't tell me where the east boundary was at that time. But if you draw a line from Tucker Street to Phillips, it's pretty well a straight line, and it, it cuts across that big, uh, what we used to call a holler, uh, up there. <clears throat> Bill Abel was doing a good job uh, last month explaining that Troy Avenue got its name because it was once the road that went from Dyersburg to Troy. Uh, he did this uh, through map, mapping and so forth. And now, of course, you go through Newburn. Well, you used to go through Newburn uh, to get there. This is, this is Tucker here. And this, of course, goes on up, up Troy Avenue. That's about, uh, that's in about 1920. Here we have the other end of Troy Avenue looking south from Parr. You see it was a boulevard at that time. And that's about 1920. This area of Troy Avenue is on the National Register for Historic Places. Mill Avenue. <clears throat> I'm going to read this, but then I'm, gonna, I'm going to get back to it a little bit later. 
The first mill in the county was a water-powered grist mill. Everybody familiar with what a grist mill is, where you grind your grain. Uh, and it water-powered so that water ran over a water wheel, which turned the gizmo, which turned the other gizmo. Uh, was built on Mill Creek by Griffith L. Rutherford in 1826. Mill Creek flowed along the side of the present Mill Avenue from which it gets its name. Griffith was son to John Rutherford, who along with Henry Rutherford and Oliver Crenshaw settled Key Corner, now in Lockdale County. They're the ones who started Dyer County, basically. <clears throat> and here we have uh, the intersection of court and mill, and of course, this is court, this is mill, here. This would be City Drug uh, Company. Now this area right here, this lot, is where the First Citizens built their building. Now we're going to come back and address this area uh, a little in, in another slide or two here. But just keep in mind that is that is where the bank was built. Here is the southern end of Mill Avenue. Uh, this is the Pendle and, and and it was it, well, we know it's Ed, 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 Eddington Lamp, but it was Pennell Eddington at that time. This is the cigar company where the cigar store of uh, cigar factory was. Now this thing right here tells me that all you needed to paint a smokestack at that time was a very long rope and a two by six board. I've uh, got another shot if he's on up, up here a little bit closer. But there he is doing his work for 25 cents an hour, I guess. I don't know. But the <clears throat> story is that there was a large ravine that ran from the river back here and ran up where these buildings are continued on across well didn't mean that one but continued on across that up through this is where uh, um, Pennington is and on up into this this building here the corner of this building is the uh, would be the, the southwest corner of the square or where Mainers used to be. This ravine came all the way from the river up through here and the story is that if you were to go down deep enough under these buildings that you would find a bunch of big trees that were thrown into the, the ravine to fill it in, help fill it in. <clears throat> I'm going to assume that that ravine and Mill Creek was the same thing. Now, where did Mill Creek start? What furnished the water to Mill Creek? I don't know, but that's something that I'm going to try to find out. But it, it had to have enough force to turn one of those big water wheels to turn the, uh, the stones in the grist mill. And I never, I never heard that until I got, got into this. Uh, David, what's the building on the right? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. This would be the old Hamby Motel and so forth. Yeah. At one time, that um, uh, in our time, or in my time, uh, uh, what was his name? Had a jewelry store there? Bob, or Kevin Ball. Jones is feet. Jones. Jones is what I'm thinking about. Jones had feet. So all of these buildings, of course, have been torn down. But the Hamby was right in, somewhere right in here. 
Yeah, that's the lot where Diane Moore's new office is located now. Do your right ear. I mean your left ear. Alright. And this just shows another picture of of, of, of Mill. Now there that's that's the uh, well it's a mustard store now, but it was the old post office. So you know it, 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 if what I'm saying is right, this there's a creek that came up through there. Now I, I I don't know. I can't. I find it, but I don't find it. So. Well, you got a pretty good drop. Pardon? You got a pretty good drop from the Perks. courthouse to the river, and that would be if they may have had a flume built up. Well, to I'm, run I'm the thinking. To dump I'm, it on top of a wheel. And, and when I get to another slide here, uh, it, it may it, it may give us a little bit more information, but there was a spring at the bottom of Elm here. <laughs> still one, still one. Okay, and you know we're talking about a matter that you know if you can if you can close your eyes and if you can visualize what what this area looked like. You know, it's a mountainous area, and you have springs that that come out of areas like this. Now, what was that it, or was it a tributary that came out west of here, out of the Fork of Deer, and came through? I don't know, but I know that there had to be sufficient water there to turn turn that water wheel. Well, there may not have been water all year round, but that's true. It grinded when the when the rain wheel went real well. That's very true. And there is a big, you know, some large gullies here that that uh, uh, that water could have run through. McGoy Street. McGoy Street was the north boundary of the original 60 acres of the town of Barrisburg. Dr. R. H. McGoy. Now I've looked and looked. And R.H. is all that I can find. Uh, you know, whether it's Robert Henry or Rufus Harrell or what, I don't know. But, but R.H., in all the uh, instances that I found his name was, it was simply R.H. Uh, he was one of the early physicians in Dyer County. He was born in Lauderdale County about 1818, and it appears that he graduated the medical school of University of Louisville in 1843, where his thesis was modus operandi of doctor. <laughs> anyway, that's the plant that produces epicac, epicac, epicac. And so he was studying the modus operandi. Why? Well, I guess why it made you throw up or. Or whatever, which is the plant that Epicac uh, is derived. In 1860, the Dyer County Census uh, listed his uh, he listed his occupation as merchant. His personal estate at that time was listed as seventeen thousand eight hundred dollars. I find I find this next statement very strange. A wife Straw, who was Civil War general. Southern Civil War General, was listed as living in the same abode. I'm going to look at that a little bit more and see if I can figure out why. But anyway, he was married to Mary A. Richardson, September 1, 1845. The 1880 census lists his age at 62 and his occupation as a doctor. There is evidence he also practiced medicine in Lauderdale County. He was elected president of the Dyer County Medical Society in July 1884. He died February uh, 1887 and is buried in the Dyersburg City Cemetery. Here's a shot of Church Street 
looking up from Church Street, looking down Magoa. Looking east down Magoa. So this would be Church Street here. And this is a photo that I'm sure most of you have seen. Uh, but it's, it, it, I like this because it's the intersection of three uh, 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 streets that we're talking about tonight. And of course, that's the uh, uh, Dr. Landrum or or uh, 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 okay, and or and uh, or the or the sanitarium. And you see this device right here? You know what that's for? Yes. That's to let heat out. You see, you also see this on the old high school building that was over here. It's like a heat chimney. A gentleman by the name of Columbus Parr, now I have not tied that into Parr Avenue. Uh, that may come on part two. He was born around 1844 and he lived at 413 Church Street. Uh, he gives it the following account. Church Avenue from Illinois south to the railroad was known as the racetrack. Now that would be with horses, by the way. Uh, and each Saturday, after some of the citizens of the town and county became more or less intoxicated, <coughs> many races were had on this street, and betting invites were the order. And so it's not much different from the day. I mean, <laughs> he further stated that where the bank building, this is what I was, I was alluding to um, earlier, where the bank building is now located was once a swamp of pond. And water stood at, that, at this point most of the year, and that this swamp was filled with cattails and water lilies. When the excavation for the bank building was being dug, he was set by the by the eye watching, and that he was interested in seeing if he could tell how deep the, the old swamp originally was. And that's at the end of Mill Street, or Mill Creek, if you would. So does this tie together? You, you've got to think that it does. Now, where did, how did he get there? Again, I don't know. <clears throat> Clark Avenue. This is Mr. Charles Clark, or Charlie Clark, Charlie P. Clark. <coughs> Clark Street was the first west boundary of the town of Dyersburg. Now, for those of you who don't know, Clark Street is an alley that runs down beside the library building. Uh, from Magoy all the way to the river. The original Clark home was a large brick home located for the Dyer County Fairgrounds in that area uh, once were next to Burnham Field. He along with other Clark family members are buried in the old burial ground nearby. Now we have, we have taken that uh, project on and trying to get the city uh, and whatever to clean that cemetery up. It is still there, uh, and, and so. But now we know a little. More, we now know a little more about why that that cemetery is there because that was their home place that day. It said Mr. Clark was the town's first mayor, but the records do not reflect that. Uh, they do indicate that Mr. Clark was mayor from 72 to 73, and again in 76 to 78. Uh, Mr. Clark was blind in his later years, which you can kind of guess that. Here are a couple of, of uh, Tennessee land grants, and I've got to research this. Uh, the Tennessee land grant 
It's not the Revolutionary War grant which was given to the people who fought in the war. And I, and I don't know if, the, if this is, was in lieu of what we do now as a, as a Dyer County deed uh, or, or what. Uh, but I've got to research this a little bit. But he was granted, in 1851, he was granted 130 acres in Dyer County in 1885. He was granted 168 and a half acres, which is pretty good. T.C. Gordon. <clears throat> he was a prominent lawyer up there in Burr for many years. He was born in Jackson, Louisiana in 1856. He came to Trenton after graduating from Centenary College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he received uh, his BA degree. Mr. Gordon was an unusual character, very original and witty, having a fine sense of humor, and his life was very interesting and colorful. After teaching school in Trenton for two years, he taught in Newburn before coming to Dyersburg in 1874. He was appointed assistant superintendent of schools and later superintendent for, for several years. During President Grover Cleveland's administration, he spent four years in North Dakota in the United States Indian service. After returning to Dyersburg, he was elected circuit court clerk for two counties <coughs> and was then elected by representative from Dyer Lake in Obine County. During these busy years, he studied law and by close application and hard study, he equipped himself by individual effort to enter the practice of law and soon had an extensive practice. His office was in the building where B and H liquor store was on Main Street, and, and I got I, I got to applaud Danny. Danny didn't know where B and H liquor store was, <laughs> <laughs> but it, where Tony. When I said it's where Tony's picture really is, he knew exactly <laughs> where it was. Um, on Main Street. In 1879, T.C. Gordon married Kate Latta, daughter of Captain S.R. Latta, uh, Albert. Uh, there is a record that T.C. Gordon bought two tracts of land from J.W. Sealsby and Mrs. Mrs. Mary Richards in 1881 and 82, 91 and 92, but there's no record of when they built their large two-story frame house on Troy, that's just a little bit of a misnomer, uh, on a lot which included Gordon and Oak Street. Extended from Troy on the west to a line east of the A.B. Hendren home. Uh, and I, I'm going to assume A.B. Hendren lived behind Hendren's girl station. He died April 30th, 1927 and is buried in the Fairview Cemetery. Now I've called out two cemeteries, the city and the Fairview. The city gun stands on each court. Fairview, of course, is at the bottom. This is taken 1916 from Troy, which is here, looking east on Oak Street. This area or this corner right here would have been where uh, first first Christian church building was at one time. This is Gordon Street, taken about the same time. Uh, and again, this is Big Troy out here, uh, looking east up Gordon Street. Um, over here would have been uh, Gibson's Pure Oil Station, for those who may remember that. And here was the Gulf Station, which now is a detail shop. It gave a it gave a house number. A census report gave a house number for Mr. Gordon, and it said Gordon Street, and it gave a number, and that number. It, it, if, if you plugged it into Google Maps, it came out at 
the intersection of um, uh, Hillcrest and, and go to Pensacola. I'm not sure that that's right, but I, I, I do believe that the house was between, uh, in this area, between the two streets. Gordon Street is in a national register for historic places and also Elm Street and part of Sampson Avenue. Hey, when did they build the big water tower? <sighs> John Bill, you know, I think I remember them building that thing. Yeah, that, the green one, they had a, a black iron one when I was a young kid, I remember. They had, and I posted a picture on uh, on Facebook, put it on Facebook, anyway, they had, a, they had water pressure problems and, and, and the, the picture I posted was them testing uh, the water pressure downtown. All of the insurance companies were pulling out of Barrisburg because they didn't have enough water pressure to hit the, the top floors. And I don't, you know, and I don't know if that was prior to the the big tank. I well, what it was certainly prior to the big tank. And, and I don't know, you know, I don't know which tower we had, water tower we had. But, um, but I seem to recall them building that the, the green one. You know, and the, the old one wasn't as big around. It it was up on that hill. You thought it had been pressure, but it. It turned out I had the volume. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dawson Street. <laughs> I picked these streets not necessarily but because everybody would know where they were, but but because there was a little history involved in the, in the, the people who were involved with the streets. Charles C. E. Dawson, born in Dyer County in 1849, was the son of Colonel W.A. and Amanda C. Clark Dawson. His father was of Irish descent, a native of North Carolina, born in 1822, and was a boat, boatman, boatman and a farmer by occupation. In youth, he came to Dyer County and lived there at the time of his marriage. He then located in Dyersburg, whence he boated on the Borgadier and Mississippi Rivers. He actually bought 200 acres near town and engaged in farming. He was a prominent citizen and was sheriff of the county six years. In 1887, Charlie Dawson built his home on his land north of Dyersburg. I don't know, but I think that it did you know where Dawson Street is. I think that's probably the area that, that, that they're talking about, that he built his home. Uh, he was elected sheriff of Dyer County for several terms, and they were active in the Christian church. Sampson Avenue. Isaac Sampson was an early settler of West Kentucky, and one of the first to locate in Dyer County. He received several land grants. His home was on Sampson Avenue, where J.W. Curry was located, or is located, well, where the house was either located or it was the same house. I'm not certain. Uh, he was one of the first practitioners before the Dyer County Bar. Uh, okay, and I skip one in 1850. Uh, he was the richest man in Dyer County. I think his net worth was like 13 to 5. Each has got more money than that. This is one of the. <laughs> this is one, another one of the West Tennessee land grants. This was 648 acres. I would read that. I cannot read that. I tried. <laughs> and then this is an older picture of the of the Curry home or the Sampson home, whatever it, it may be. 1939. <laughs> We have seen some older things where that's called High Street before it was Samson. Yeah. I don't know whether I can't remember now where we saw that, whether it was on the yeah. Samson Mount or. I don't know. Yeah, 
got, when I Christ gave that for our house, he got that far enough. Oh, okay, says, okay, I see. It says high straight on the eastern edge of God's world. It could have been just the portion. Well, it's probably the fourth. It's not the fourth. Yeah. Uh, because um, the upper end of Church Street, where the post office is now, uh, that was that was uh, named Ladder. Uh, so, yeah. So I don't know. Tucker Street, Dr. William Henry Tucker was born in Middle Tennessee in 1935. He came to Double Bridges. They run over Double Bridges. Is. <coughs> well, more than one raising hand, so I won't be able to get into it. Uh, the he married Miss Frances E. Johnson of Cajun. He moved to Dyersburg in 1878. In 1859, he practiced medicine and double bridges until 1878. He served in the Confederate Army under General Forrest from 1864 to 65. There's a record in the Dyer County Courthouse that in 1867, there was a lot on which there was a four-room brick house belonging to G.W. Gallows. There's no record of G.W. Gallows, but the will he left is very unique. He will to his wife and daughter, Mrs. G.W. Miller, the house and contents. In 1868, Ms. Miller sold the property, the home, to Dr. Tucker. He built their house on which the original four brick rooms was a part, were a part. It was an outstanding house built in the style of that era with wide front porch and cupola above the second floor. It was on Tucker Street from which, which was named for Dr. Tucker. Dr. Tucker was a very prominent doctor for many years and also an outstanding businessman. He had an interest in many enterprises. He was at one time mayor of Dyersburg. I'm not sure where that house was. Danny and I discussed it a little bit, though, you know. Bill Laker, I think. Where? Still there. Is that the second, second house on the second floor? Yeah, with the big, big wall. Yeah. That's, that, that's what we, I would, uh, if that wasn't perfect, because that's the only brick home uh, that I recall down through there, that, uh, that, that, that would have gone to that, that age. Maybe the oldest, one of the oldest. You know, when you get a chance, correct the first line of your slide. Because he couldn't have been born in 1935. Okay. It would right. be 1835. 1835. It's <laughs> late nights right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that shows that uh, Dr. Tucker died in 1915 and was buried in the city cemetery. And there's his gravestone. A couple of shots of Tucker Street. Uh, this is looking east from Canal. You'd be standing here at Canal, looking east. So I know what direction east is. And this is looking east from Lake Road or Nichols Avenue uh, on top. Nichols slash Lake Road, John M. Nichols. John got sticky. Henry Harrison Nichols was born in 1816 and married Mary Moore in 1836. They were born in Franklin, Tennessee. John Milton Nichols, the second of eight children, born in 1844. The family moved to Dyersburg in 1890, when John was six years of age. In 1874, John Nichols was elected sheriff of Dyer County and held that position until 1880. He also served as Dyersburg's first city marshal. Let me make a comment. He 
it was kind of a, it, it appeared to be kind of a metro type government at that time. Instead of a city and a county, it was just gut government. You know, and so it, it, this kind of says that, that they finally did break out and they had a marshal and they had a, a sheriff. Uh, they acquired a considerable amount of property in both Dyersburg and Dyer County. In 1881, he established the Nichols and Company Wooden Mobile Factory. Uh, he owned a brick and tile company that was located on Nichols Avenue behind the lot where his home stood in the area of where the Tennessee National Guard was. Got it? The brick and tile business operated under several names. Klondike Brick and Tile Works, Tennessee Brick and Tile Works, and finally Nichols Brick and Tile Works. He was also one of the founders of Orchid Air Hardware Company. Many of the older brick homes in Dyersburg was built by his construction company. Here is his house that was on uh, on Nichols Avenue. Uh, Danny and I had a discussion today about which way this was facing. Albert, do you, do you have an idea? Danny thinks that this was the west side of the house and this was the south side. But later on, <clears throat> it changed to this. I do know that this is the south side. And Mr. Nichols was very adamant in working with his contractor that because of his love for the Confederacy, it had to face south. <laughs> That's a very, we got we got to tour of that board head and it's just it's something else. This is Nichols Avenue. There was some construction. Uh, Danny seems to think this one put this up that color underneath the road there. And uh, Baker's Leona was right there. Everybody remembers Baker's Leona. Uh, more and more sales on this side or um, well, short stop. <clears throat> and this is another shot of the same, from the same area after construction. I remember when they changed it, I remember, I don't remember when, but I remember them changing it from Nichols to Lake Road. But I didn't know the story behind Nichols, but I knew that it went to the lake. Does anybody, does anybody know why, what the motive was? I believe it was Nichols when we moved here in 78. I think so. We lived in that one of those. Yeah, it was in 71. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still oh, Did they have an actual kiln on Nichols? I, I, I had this they did. They did. It had a pretty good smokestack, I would think. Um, I don't see it in that picture. It just might not have Well, you may not have the same from there. From the shots we had, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly where the kill was. Uh, it, it, went, it was behind that house, but I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, that, that, that they're a pretty big area right there. I seem to remember one of the kids. It seems like it was some kind of brick smoke stack off of Kist Avenue. Um, like it maybe was another brick kiln or something out there. Yeah. The Suck family was of wealth extent, having lived in Brecon, Wells. They migrated to North Carolina, and after living there a long time, they moved to Henderson County, Kentucky, where Edgar Gallatin Suck was born in 1820. In 1845, he was married to Amy uh, Elizabeth Ford, soon after they moved to Dyersburg. After arriving in Dyersburg about 15 years before the Civil War, he parked land for the Francis Theater, and, or, and it's got a press dollar store, but anyway, where it once stood, and built a large building and operated <laughs> as a hotel. This was known as the Soviet Hotel. This was also known as 
the uh, dying part of the hospital. Uh, it was associated, he was associated in business with the firm of Sug and Pendleton, which later became known as the Fork and Deer Hardware. Mr. Sug was a professional surveyor and, and accumulated a large acreage of land in West Tennessee and Mississippi County, Arkansas. He also bought and sold many of the three lots laid off in the original plot of the city. That may be a mistake, but anyway. Uh, the original plot of the city of Dyersburg, which was made in 1825. When the Civil War came on, Edgar Gallatin so joined Company 47 Tennessee Infantry. In 1875, he was made mayor of Dyersburg. William S. Thug, brother of Edgar Gallatin, was one of Dyersburg's first lawyers. Six children were born to Edgar Gallatin and Amy Elizabeth, with only two surviving to maturity. They were Mary Emily and William Thomas Sutton. They were born in Dyersburg at the once location of Jim Collins' home on East Court which included the property where Collins Auto Park was located. This home was known as the E.G. Sub Home Place. It was described in an old day as being south of the academy ground facing the old Trenton Road. And of course, academy grounds is this area, well, this area right in here. That's the home where Charlie Whitnell lives today. Yeah. Sug Place. This is what most of us know. Uh, in 1885, William Thomas Sug purchased a lot on what is now the corner of Sug Place and Tucker Street. A large two-story house was constructed and was a Sug home for several generations. He was the owner of a large, a large farm acreage in West Tennessee in Mississippi County, Arkansas. He built the American <coughs> Hotel, which he's, he operated for a while, and, the later, and later the building was leased to the Dyersburg General Hospital. Edgar Gallatin's son's daughter married Joe R. Baker in 1897, and they had a son, Joe R. Baker. Joe R. Baker's son inherited the Sug house hotel property. The old building was re replaced when Joe built what was to become the Francis Theater building and the building next to it, which was a Ford place. The theater was leased to Will Shepard and he named it the Francis Theater after his granddaughter, Francis Shepard Falls. This was in 1912. Will Shepard was also <coughs> The one, he also had the first automobile. <coughs> he also uh, built the first power plant in Dyersburg, which he later sold to the city. <coughs> this is standing on <coughs> Church Street here, and that's the old sub place right there. That was in 1896. Look. Miller Avenue. Captain George Burrow Miller, <coughs> born in 1825, York. His father, Colonel William Henry Harrison Miller, was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1780. He came to Tennessee as a young man and located in Reynoldsville. Later called Yorkville in, in Gibson County. He was the first mayor of Yorkville. He came to Dyer County and became one of the most prominent men in town. In 1852, he married a young widow, Mary A.B. Luscombe, who had a son, three years old, Frank Luscombe, Jr. Their home was located on Lake Street. It was a large frame house with tall canals. A wide front porch extended across the entire house, along with trees and flowers extended from Mongoy 
to Miller. Do you know where Miller is? Miller Street is? Yeah. To the post office. That right. It runs from, yeah. from Fex over to King Avenue. Yeah. 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 Uh, he owned all of Miller Street and a tract of land next to Phillips Street. W.S. Cooper built his house on the corner of College and Avery. A street was opened extending from Phillips to College. That's the street right across the street. Uh, Mr. Miller named the street A.B. in honor of his, of his wife, but by some mistake, it was written Avery in the deed, and so he just left. <laughs> I mean, you can't fight City Hall. <laughs> King Avenue. I, when, I, when I studied this, I was... I was, I was actually a little surprised because it wasn't exactly what I, I the story wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. Thomas F. King moved from Memphis to Dyersburg in 1882. He opened a general merchandise business on the southeast corner of Main and Market. His son Edward lived on King Street prior to building the, the King Mansion. He and his brother Theodore had their homes on each side of their father's two-story house that was built in 1870. The, the location of these houses was on the block of King Street at the end of West Court where the old Kroger and Via Pudder stores were built. A year after Ed, Ed's house burned, he began construction on the King Mansion. I, I, I kind of thought that King Mansion was where the name came from, but I'm wrong. And there's a there's a shot of the, an older shot of the King of the King Mansion. Of course, it was a very society-driven uh, family, and and and, uh, and and of course the mansion. Okay, one more thought. One more thought, and then I'll be I'll be through. We uh, I, I said earlier on the first slide that that the treaty of 1818 was signed between Andrew Jackson and, and Chickasaw Indian. And I'm going to read this, and I, I I had a comment to make, but I said I wouldn't make. <laughs> After the Chickasaw signed the Treaty of 1818, the document that officially ceded their claims to the land we now call West Tennessee, the ancient hunting trails were widened to make them easier to travel with wagons and supplies. Settlers, mostly from North Carolina, quickly rushed in to claim these lands, replacing the ancient names of things with new ones. The river that had been known as Okina, everybody knows that Forkadere was Okina, was given to the name of Forkadere. Ancient mounds that were built by a native people dating from around the time of Christ were named for a sur surveyor named Pinson, Pinson Mound. The last great Chickasaw War Chief was named Tishomingo. He served under Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812 and was the principal signer of the 1818 Treaty. When the Indian Removal Act finally resulted in the people being forced out <laughs> along the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, Tishomingo accompanied his people on the journey. The people were being forced to leave using the same Natchez Trace the 1801 treaty allowed the Americans to build. They were destined for the reservation in Oklahoma, 600 miles away. But, but Chief Tishomingo did not survive the trip. He, like so many others, died of smallpox <coughs> on the journey that came to be known as the Trail of Tears. Well, I, I, I'll shorten my comment. It can't happen. 
There's my references. That's my program. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. If I don't know the answer, then you can submit them online and I'll get back to you. Tell about creeks. Were there any old maps identified springs in this area? I, I haven't been able to find them. I suspect that living in a building that's built on top of one because the basement leaks badly. Yeah. <laughs> Just a comment about uh, Nichols Avenue. We, we moved here in 1978, and for a few months we rented the, a house there next to Bernie Beasel, for those of you that knew mm -hmm. Bernie and her husband Bill. Um, I came up here just prior to moving to rent the place, and I asked Bernie, uh, who turned out to be a wonderful, wonderful neighbor and wonderful lady. She was a treasured person. I asked her, I said, Miss Bernie, <coughs> I need to write an address. And she said, honey, you just put Lakewood, Dyersburg, Tennessee, and they'll all know where you are. That's what that was called. Yeah. It's called Lakewood. And sure enough, that's the way we got our mail for yeah. a while is by just Lakewood. There was a pond back behind the big house that you had the picture of. Probably it was a pond that was associated with the old brick, brick place. But that's why they called it Lakewood, because that small pond, they called it a lake. So. In, in Mr. Nichols' diary, he, he uh, uh, talked about the pond, about mm -hmm. checking the pond to see if it was frozen so it could go ice skating and <laughs> so forth. Yeah, we grew up, grew up in Larkin, just close to Parker. We called it Parker's Pond. Oh, okay. Yeah. He said when he was young, they had that big house up there and they kept the thing cleaned out and people swam in it. Yeah. And, uh, John was, Parker lives in a brick house, didn't he? Uh, Tim, Tim Hamer Johnson takes care of that house we know is the Beasel home, the one that uh, he's talking about. Uh, he lives in the house next door there. Um, and he runs the Green Frog and those, you know, the, the Java Cafe. And he is a caretaker of that home that you showed earlier that I, th I think faced west, and then they built that uh, big four-column porch facing south. Um, and that pond is still there. And Tim has cleaned all that up. He takes care of that yard uh, because the family has let him do some work on it, repairing the roof. He redid the kitchen. And if you remember, he was actually renting it out as a... Uh, meeting place and having receptions and things but they got into some situations I, I talked to him the other day about this because I was going to have my high school reunion over there but he doesn't do that anymore because of regulations about um, handicap accessibility and square footage and fire exits and all that kind of stuff uh, but it's a nice home and he's done a lot of work on it so he, he's maintaining it what he's which house does he live in? He lives in the one that I think you must have rented. We did. The White House. Uh, it's it's the right, White House. right there on the edge of the road. Not the brick house. That's right. Yeah. He lives in that house and takes care of the big one. That's what he does. I think there's maybe four or five children who have that house in the estate. I think they live in Texas. I don't really know. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting place. It'd be a great place for a museum. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it but uh, it's a it's a it's one of the nicer homes in Dyer County if you think about it. If you take the King Mansion and that one, you know, and even the ones up on Tucker, uh, there's some nice ho old homes still around here. Uh, one street I can think of that wasn't mentioned that the uh, Sanborn maps that Bill talked about last month. Um, those are good resources, and the library has. 1919 Sanborn, I think. There's two versions or three of those things. Uh, Parkview at one time was called Lauderdale. Yeah. So uh, a lot of these names have changed over the years. I think that's very interesting. Yes. One thing, if I remember correctly, when the water, the Dyersburg water plant was down right beside the Forkadier River. That's right. 
the entire, for its entire water supply was artesian and it was under considerable amounts of pressure. Uh, it's very possible that part of that water could have been busy over the years coming up through there and could have contributed to the swamp, the whole works there. Well, that, that, but the only thing is, I believe that that was prior to the building of that. Now, the artesian well, I mean, it, I, mean I guess the, the, the spring or whatever could have been there. That's what I mean. I yeah. know with that artesian pressure, it could have had a pretty active spring in that area. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? I certainly appreciate your attendance. Uh, if you are a, a member of the Dyer County Historical Society, thank you for coming. If you are not a member of the Dyer County Historical Society, we welcome your, your contribution. It is tax deductible. Uh, so I, 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 did admit, I did skip some streets and hopefully I can come back at a later date uh, with part two on some of this. Thank you for coming.